Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, who called us to live to a higher standard each day. As this series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Our theme today is the fear of rejection, and later on we'll be thinking about marriage as we continue a series called Appreciation for Men. We're up to part seven and eight of this ten-part series. Also joining us today, Elizabeth's brother, Jim Howard, talking about some happy memories, one including a tarantula. Also, Elizabeth will tell a story about the men of the jungle that fits right in with our theme of appreciation for men as she tells an Alka story. Now that coming a little later. Right now, though, it's part seven of Appreciation for Men, The Fear of Rejection. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot talking again today about the weaknesses of men. And I want to assure you at the very beginning that I certainly hope I'm not coming across with a critical spirit at all. We are weak human beings, and one of our weaknesses is that we don't like to admit our weaknesses. And the Lord has to remind us in sometimes very painful ways of how weak we are in order that we may learn to draw on His strength. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Another translation of that same verse says, power comes to its full strength in weakness. So let's not deny our weaknesses. Let's bring them out into the clear light of the presence of God and say, Lord, here it is. Help me. Have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Here's a prayer request that came to Gateway to Joy. A man who says, I would like to meet the right woman who I can marry and have a happy family with. The problems are with me getting in the way of this coming to pass. I have a personality disorder, ambivalence, catastrophic negative thinking. I never heard that phrase before. And he says, when I approach women, I feel great trepidation. I've been in therapy with Christian psychologists and a psychiatrist. I'm not sure it's helping. I'm 32, heartbroken over my singleness. I am a loser with women. Well, you are not alone. It's amazing how often I hear that story. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about my second husband, Addison H. Leach. He was a big, strong man. He was six feet two. He was a football player. He was a professional baseball player for a while. He was a swimming coach for 19 summers in boys' camps. He was a good tennis player. He played all sports, I guess. I thought he was very handsome. I was completely swept off my feet by him. And he told me, in Absolute honesty, he said, this is the straight truth. He said, all the way through high school and college, I thought if any girl ever accepted a date with me, it would be out of pity. I said, you got to be kidding. No. He said, I, I'm serious. I really believed that no woman would ever dream of looking at me twice except out of pity. Well, my husband Lars confirms that. He says that men think women are smarter than they are. They don't want to have an explosion of emotion. They don't want to hurt them. They don't know how to talk to them. So there's reluctance and refusal to acknowledge weakness. And I suppose of all fears, there's nothing like the fear of rejection. And as I believe with all my heart that men are created to be the initiators, and God certainly intended for Adam to take responsibility for Eve, it's a heavy burden. And if a man initiates and pursues a woman with a view to courtship and marriage, and she gives him the cold shoulder, that's painful, isn't it? Of course. Who wants to be rejected? Nobody. But it takes a real man to take that risk. They fear the loss of respect. And, well, there are just a whole lot of other things. Maybe you can write me some letters and tell me some of the things that I left out that you're afraid of. 
But if the man is going to be the initiator in a man-woman relationship, he has to be willing to take responsibility and to accept the risk of rejection. My first husband, Jim Elliott, was a very forthright man. He accused me of having a sledgehammer personality, but if anybody had a sledgehammer personality, it was Jim Elliott. And when he preached, he was a pulpit pounder. I can remember a time when he actually banished uh, one of the Indians from the church service because of that Indian's behavior in the church service. Let me read to you from 2 Timothy some things that Paul has to say to the young pastor. God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us, and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality through the gospel. And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Now there is a source of strength. Know whom you believe and be convinced that he is able to keep or to guard what you have entrusted to him for that day. You can entrust to God your fears and your weaknesses. If you can't bring yourself to confess them to anyone else, and perhaps there isn't any need to confess them to anyone else, I suppose most of our weaknesses are pretty obvious to other people. But if you can't bring yourself to acknowledge them publicly or verbally to someone else, bring them to God. He is able to keep what you entrust to him. Just give him your fears. And he goes on to say, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. That was one of Jim Elliott's life verses. It's the verse he wrote in my yearbook when I was a senior in college. A soldier on active service will not become entangled in civilian affairs. I must say that I am surprised when I receive letters from men who have not managed to find a wife and who greatly desire to do so because I receive shoals of mail from women who are longing to be married. Now, would you like me to start a dating service? No, don't even think of asking me to do anything like that. There are a lot of them out there, and I'm not at all sure that I can recommend them. I do believe that God knows how to send you the right person at the right time. But some of these men who haven't been able to find a wife ask me what to do. And so in case there's one of those men listening to me right now, just let me give you a few very simple suggestions. The first one is to stop dating, to give yourself space and time and quiet to think and to pray before God without distractions. If you're dating, you've got a lot of distractions. So first of all, stop dating. Secondly, start praying. I would strongly urge you to find an older Christian, a spiritual father or mother, perhaps someone in your church who knows how to pray and how to keep his mouth shut. Ask that person to pray with you about this matter. And if you're praying with a man who has a godly wife, it just might be that between the two of them, they might find 
the right woman for you, they might already have been thinking about someone and wondering why you hadn't seen her. It's very important that we be willing to listen to older Christians who are wise, who have perspective, and who may be able to bring the two of you together. So, number one, stop dating. Number two, start praying and pray with an older person. Perhaps it's your parents, but perhaps not. Just ask God to help you to find someone who can give you support and encouragement and advice. Number three, submit your wish list to God. Maybe you have a list of the qualifications that you are insisting upon finding and you haven't found them. Why don't you just surrender that list to God and say, Lord, I give you my list. Now I will take your list. You find the right woman. I will accept your choice. And then this may seem like a very strange concept or precept, but for number four, I've put down, assume that she's somewhere nearby. You don't have to traipse all over the earth looking for the woman that God wants you to marry. God knows how to bring her across your path where you are or bring you across her path. And perhaps it will be through that spiritual father or mother or a friend of yours. It's amazing how many courtship stories, and I've been studying a lot of courtship stories lately, it's been amazing to me how many of them, I would say in almost every one, there is a third party. Why shouldn't God work through third parties today as he has done throughout human history? Remember that Abraham sent his servant to find a wife for his son Isaac. Don't be afraid to confess your weaknesses to God, to ask him for his strength. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. God bless you. Appreciation for Men, Part 7, that was the fear of rejection. We'll be hearing from Elizabeth again later as she talks about the men of the jungle. And uh, right now, let's hear from her brother, Jim Howard, as he uh, tells us about some happy times, even though one of those uh, times included a tarantula as a present. We would spend our vacation times, the vacations that my father took, in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. I had lots of happy memories of being there at an old family place. And one memory is my big sister taking me out to the edge of the porch in the morning sunlight and having a microscope with her and finding a very small insect and putting it under the microscope and then pointing out to me the delicacy of that creation of that very small creature. So things like that interested her and she loved to help me understand and catch some of the beauty of such things. Also, uh, one day she took me down to the mountain stream in the forest. I was very young. I probably was six or seven. She built a lean-to, and she took me camping to sleep overnight by the stream. Uh, a happy memory. And then when we hiked the trails of those mountains through the years, she was always a very strong hiker, and she enjoyed the out of doors. When she was in Ecuador, I would receive little packages occasionally in the mail. And on one occasion, I excitedly opened the package and it was a rhinoceros beetle from the jungle. And I don't mean that it was live, it was dead, but it was an actual beetle. And she wrote, a little note explaining how the rhinoceros beetle lives in the jungle and how he, he gets his prey. Uh, another time, I opened a box, and here came a tarantula from the jungle of Ecuador for me, for my excitement. And I probably was 12, 10, 12 years old. The tarantula, again, was not living. It was dead, but it was a real tarantula. <laughs> so... Those were just a few little things that others would not know, but of course I remember them well. That was Elizabeth's brother, Jim Howard. Later on, we'll hear from Elizabeth. As we're thinking about appreciation for men, she'll talk about some men of the jungle. 
and uh, a story from her time there with the Alka people. Right now, we begin looking at moving toward marriage as we continue thinking about appreciation for men. Moving toward marriage, that business of moving toward marriage. Now, it is obvious that God's will for most men is to marry. There are some, Jesus said, who are born eunuchs. Some are made eunuchs, and some become eunuchs for the kingdom of God. A eunuch is a man who is sexually sterile. Someone has referred to the men in their 30s as the postponed generation. Now, there are many reasons for this. I think that the feminist movement has put all sorts of new fears into men's minds, and God knows they had enough fears before the feminists came along. Jobs nowadays require higher training, longer schooling, and let's face it, women are all too available, and commitment isn't necessary. Too many men are getting what they want from women without the necessity of the commitment of marriage. That's tragic. And, of course, it's disobedience to God. Letters keep coming from both men and women who are in a quandary about how one ought to move toward marriage. While I was sitting here rereading some of them, a man phoned with a question about the subject. I wonder what's happening. Why so much confusion? Well, here's one of the letters. I'm a male Christian who needs help. I just ended a long-term relationship with a non-Christian girl. I made plenty of compromises during those years, and by God's grace, I hope next time will be better. I read your book, The Mark of a Man, and was shown things I never knew before, which blew my mind. I'm excited about the idea of sharing life with a girl in a way which would honor Jesus. At the same time, I get scared about making bad moves when to initiate, and financial fears about supporting a family if I'm a missionary, which at the moment I'm being directed to. These things may seem silly, but they're real to me. Could you address some issues which could benefit us guys who see marriage as a blessing and not as years of imprisonment? Well, I'm surely glad that there are some guys who see marriage as a blessing and not as years of imprisonment. But let me assure you that the questions are not silly to me. Far from it. They are vital questions. And I'm glad there are men to whom they matter enough to pray about them and ask counsel for. I think one reason for confusion is the notion which arose before the men who are now in their 20s and 30s were born about the equality of the sexes. It's a word that belongs to politics, but certainly not to courtship, a realm which concerns human beings in their entirety. Another reason for confusion is misunderstanding the order which God established in the beginning. I've tried to explain that divine arrangement in two books, Let Me Be a Woman, which is on femininity, and The Mark of a Man, which is on masculinity. If men would be men, Women could do a better job of being women, and vice versa, of course. You women who are listening, we need to be as womanly, as feminine as we can be. And the more womanly and the more feminine we will be, the more manly and the more masculine will men be. But the buck really stops with the men. What does it mean to be a man? Christ is the supreme example. He was strong and he was pure because his sole aim in life was to be obedient to the Father. His very obedience made him most manly, responsible, committed, courageous, courteous, and full of love. A Christian man's obedience to God will make him more of a man than anything else in the world. Now consider these qualities responsibility at the top of the list. A man must work out the salvation that God has given him with a proper sense of awe and responsibility, Paul said in Philippians 2. 
for it is God who is at work in him, giving him the will and the power to achieve his, that is, God's, purpose. Man was made to be initiator, provider, and protector for woman. The next quality, commitment. He's got to be a man of his word, no matter what it costs. My father's strong counsel to my four brothers was never tell a woman you love her until you are ready to follow that immediately with, will you marry me? In other words, a man's love for a woman, if deep and abiding, leads to a lifetime commitment to her. Many heartaches would be avoided if men held back any expressions of love, and that means not only verbal but physical, until he is ready to make that commitment. Once promised, he never goes back on that word. The next characteristic, courage. A man has to be willing to take the risks of rejection. She might say no. The risk of blame and all that commitment costs. Then what about courtesy? A Christian's rule of life should be my life for yours. A Christian man is concerned about the comfort and happiness of others, not of himself. He is not seeking to have his own needs met, his own image enhanced, but to love God, to make God loved, and to lay down his life to that end. In small ways, as well as great, he shows the courteous love of the Lord. Purity. He must be master of himself if he's to be the servant of others. This means buffeting his body, bringing it into subjection, as Paul did. It means restraint, discipline, the strength to wait. It means an utter yielding to the will of God, as revealed in 1 Corinthians 6, 12-20 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 2-8. As I have heard the sad stories and studied what I call the dating mess of today, it seems to me that men have generally overlooked another vital matter which ought to precede all overtures in the direction of a prospective wife. If we assume that a man is an adult when he is 18, or 21 at the latest, he should by that time be giving marriage serious thought. He should get down to brass tacks with God to find out if this may be part of his agenda for him. This will take time, and it might help if during this period he just simply quits dating and starts praying. As long as the answer is uncertain, don't date. Does this sound extreme? Well, it wasn't my idea. I learned it from a group of young men who chose this way. It's a guaranteed way of avoiding sexual activity, which is always illicit outside of marriage, and you know that, and of preserving one's wholeness and holiness. I urge you to trust God. Many years ago, I had the tremendous privilege of listening to Gladys Aylward, an incredible tiny woman from London. She was a parlor maid. She went to China by herself, across Europe and Russia on a train with one suitcase with an umbrella and a frying pan strapped to the outside. She didn't have any money. She didn't have a mission board behind her. She didn't know where she was going. But she went to China, and after she'd been working there for about six years, singly, a married couple from Britain came out to work on a station nearby. She saw that they had something very wonderful, which she had never even thought of missing. She began to pray that God would give her a husband. And being a no-nonsense sort of a tiny little woman with a stentorian voice, she told me this story as we spoke in private conversation. She said, I prayed that God would call a husband for me, a man from England, send him straight out here to China, and have him propose. I will never forget the ending of that story. Gladys Aylward and I were sitting on a sofa in Canada. She leaned toward me with her snapping black eyes, and she waggled her tiny finger at me, her index finger, and she said to me, Elizabeth, I believe God answers prayer. He called him, but he never came. There's something to think about. 
perhaps God has called you to be a husband and you've never done it. Has it been out of fear? Has it been literally because you couldn't find the right woman? If God calls you, God will lead you. But you have to be open. You have to be listening. You have to be in prayer. And believe me, God does know how to answer that prayer. God loves to answer our prayers when they're in accord with his will. I urge you to trust God. He wants to give you the best. He will help you. He has promised to guide. He knows what you need. Ask him to show you whether, when, and whom you should marry. And remember, don't be alone in this prayer. Ask counsel of your spiritual superiors who are wise, who know how to pray and how to keep silence. Take their counsel seriously. If they have suggestions as to a possible mate, take those very seriously. My own parents prayed for godly spouses for all six of us and actually named before God the very people that four of us married. Will you trust him? God bless you. Part 8 in our series, Appreciation for Men. Well, before we go, Elizabeth has a story about some men of the jungle. Maybe they're not so much different from us as we would imagine. One thing the Indians were good at was laughter. I mean, they laughed at everything. And I was the object of (laughs) endless amusement. When I lived with the Alcas, I had to realize I just simply had to settle for the fact that everything I did was freakish. Everything about me was freakish. I was a giant to them because I was head and shoulders taller than the tallest woman and a head taller than the tallest man. Pitiful color skin. They'd never seen anything quite so washed out. (laughs) And my hair, they said, looked like palm fiber. I was a blonde in those days. And my eyes looked like a jaguar's because they'd never seen anything human that had anything but black eyes. The only creature they knew with blue eyes was a jaguar. When I would wake up in the morning, there would be two pairs of black eyes looking down into my hammock from an observation platform which two teenage boys had built in the house next door. Now, the house next door touched my house with the roof like this. There were no walls on any houses, of course. And so here would be these two pairs of black eyes looking down into the hammock, waiting for that stunning moment when these blue eyes would open. And they would then make an announcement to the entire clearing, which means she's awake. And that stunning piece of news would be relayed all the way around the clearing, in case anybody missed it, she's awake, she's awake. So I would get up and out of my hammock, unwrap myself from the blanket, which was one of my freakish things that I did. They slept totally naked. Of course, they lived totally naked. But I had to sleep in all my clothes, with a blanket, with the fire beside my hammock. Otherwise, I froze. And so I would take the blanket off, hang it up underneath my thatch roof, and take out of a rubber bag a small transistor transceiver radio, which had been built for me by the radio station in Quito. The HCJB crowd up there had made us this little transistor transceiver. And I would have to carry that across the clearing and attach it to an aerial on the far side of the clearing. And as I started across, as I took the radio out of its rubber bag, these two boys would make the second announcement, which was, (laughs) which means there she goes with that radio again. Uh, Of course, they had made up the word for radio, apeninga, meant the talking thing, and there she goes, is the way I was carrying it, you know. And as I walked across the clearing, every single step was accompanied by sound effects. (laughs) Now try that on your next door neighbor. Stick your head out the kitchen window as he's walking to his garage or to his car and go, eh, 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 eh. I mean, you don't really know how to respond, do you? Do you keep in step or do you shift your gait? Everything I did was amusement, and so I had to just settle for affording them nonstop entertainment. 
Well, it looks as though our time is just about at an end, but let me take some time to thank you for letting us come into your home, your office, maybe along with you as you got some exercise, wherever we found you today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org. More lectures and talks, devotionals, Gateway to Joy programs, and other resources. Check it out at elizabethelliot.org. The reviewer said, Truth for the soul. In a world full of lies, Elizabeth shares truth, wisdom, and hope from her experience walking closely with God. Well, until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with an everlasting love. And underneath are the everlasting arms 